and thank you so much for everyone for coming out tonight. A wet night, a wet Thursday night in Wyala, and uh, which is uh, good to see the rain, of course. Um, what I want to uh, talk about today is, is largely about decision making. It's about the way we make decisions about, uh, about energy and water. I'm going to particularly and deliberately focus on the, the linkages between water and energy. Given that Martin will probably address mainly the energy question, I'll have more of a water bias, but it, it seemed appropriate. So looking at uh, the, the infrastructure, the linkages between the two, the parallels between the way we consider the, the two systems, and synergies. In other words, the, the fact that the whole, if you put these two things together, the whole is greater than some of the parts, and uh, that, that is manifest in a, in a whole range of different ways. I want to take a bit of a look back through history, and here I'll be mainly talking about water, but drawing out the parallels with energy. How, where have we come from in terms of uh, water infrastructure? And uh, I'll talk about that, and, and perhaps a put, uh, look into the crystal ball a bit about what the future might be. And again, parallels, uh, strongly parallels with energy. Uh, and I'll put that in terms of four generations. Um, I want to talk about uh, what we call the demand side uh, of water and energy. Uh, so it's, it's the question about how do we sustainably reduce demand rather than increasing supply. So that's, uh, I want to focus on that, using a few examples, uh, both from water and from, from energy and from buildings, the, the role of buildings in this, um, and talk about a, a concept which, which I'll explain, a distributed infrastructure service provision, a different way of thinking about infrastructure for the future. Uh, the energy water nexus, how the, 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 they're so related, as I mean, uh, Tony illustrated with the, the front, I mean, it's pretty... Uh, coincidental that we should see the front page of the uh, advertiser saying exactly that, the theme of, of the presentation. And uh, perhaps a, a few ideas about what I think, at least, uh, should happen next. So just to... Uh, and I'll go through some of this fairly quickly because I'd really like to have some more time for questions because this is such a vast topic and uh, so hopefully we can get through it and uh, have enough time for questions both of myself and Martin. Just thinking about water, thinking about uh, water... Uh, the water cycle. Now, the water cycle is, is not just the supply of water that we see in South Australia, at least, in terms of uh, a pipeline-based system, but it's also the sewerage system is an integral part of the human-made water system and stormwater. Uh, and uh, in some, uh, some areas, that's, uh, that's an extremely important part of the uh, water supply system, or well, even, indeed, in Wyala, as we can see from today, or Adelaide, where, there, where it was quite, uh, uh, quite a lot of water running down the streets today in Adelaide. Um, and it's worth just thinking, how do we get here? How do we get a centralised system of water supply, uh, wastewater treatment uh, and disposal, wastewater disposal and treatment, and stormwater? Um, because up until the Industrial Revolution, we didn't have that. It was, uh, in fact, the, the first generation of urban water service provision. Uh, in terms of, I'm, I'm talking mainly here about uh, cities in the industrialised world, and I'm not talking about uh, the Romans and uh, indeed some uh, areas of the ancient world which uh, of course had uh, different systems. But we saw the growth of cities with the Industrial Revolution and what came with that were three things, I mean cholera, uh, floods and fires. We saw a lot of these and in fact uh, the, it was a decentralised system but it was unplanned and unmanaged and in many cases we see that now with septic tank systems. Wherever we have decentralised sewerage systems, they tend to be unplanned and largely unmanaged. Uh, there's been some attempts to improve that, but that's pretty much the state of it. It's characterised by low financial cost per household. It doesn't cost much to run, but there's high social and high uh, localised environmental costs because you have um, uh, problems. Indeed, you know, cholera was a, was a direct uh, result of that. Uh, as you get more people crowded in, and of course uh, fire risk and, uh, and flooding. These are the characteristics of that, that era. Then we had in the late 1900s, uh, and uh, particularly in the UK, there was the Chadwick Royal Commission, and which was called because uh, the, the members in the Houses of Parliament could smell the Thames, that was the first, first thing. Uh, and also there was a serious problem with uh, people dying of cholera. And so there was a, the Royal Commission was in response to that. I mean, it was starting to affect uh, industry because of uh, w workers' health and so on. Uh, and so this led to the birth of the, of the centralised systems that, we, that uh, w we've essentially had until this day. And uh, the objective originally was public health, but it led to centralised water supply and sewerage. Uh, often they were combined sewers, so stormwater and wastewater were in the same place and there was a drive to increase scale so there was a, 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 a basically an unquestioned assumption that the 
bigger the network, the better, because you have economies of scale which will drive down the cost uh, per household. So it was characterised, though, by a high financial cost per household, most of it in the pipes, the reticulation system. Now, thinking here of, of the parallels as we're going to go along with energy, uh, the, uh, the cost of, I mean, the transmission system is actually the equivalent of this. So it's got a, but it's got a high dispersed environmental cost because you have, uh, uh, the environmental cost has been pushed off to somewhere else and uh, typically in the Sydney context or in the city context that would be pushed off to the nearest waterway where it's a, it's a point source discharge rather than it sort of in the street in front of you uh, or in the Thames and so on. Um, and you've got a reduced social cost because obviously the objective was public health and that tended to work. I mean, we got the material, the, the, the uh, problematic uh, biological material away from people uh, and it's got a, a reduced localised environmental cost. And indeed, it allowed the growth of modern cities. To, to The ability to actually have a city at all was partly driven on the basis of that. So this is what I would call a second, the second generation. And one of the issues is to start to, th if we look in a historical sweep, it can help us to see what, whether that's actually all there is. I mean, is that, does it just get like that and extend it? Um, well, I would argue that um, what we've seen in the late 1990s to the 1900s to the present is actually, uh, so in other words, late last century, which is the 1990s and so on, uh, to the present day is what I would call a neo-centralised or a transition generation of, uh, of infrastructure, which is that we are taking that system and saying we will fix the problems of it by putting something on the end of it. I mean, if, if you've heard the expression end of pipe solution. And in the case of the water and, uh, and sewer system, and indeed the stormwater system, we're saying this has got problems. It's got point sources of pollution. It's got uh, uh, problems of uh, uh, taking too much water out of our rivers and so on. So we will solve it by throwing something even bigger at it uh, or uh, fixing it up at the end point. And so we've seen in, in terms of water that manifests as uh, advanced centralised wastewater treatment. So we're improving and improving to get that last bit of phosphorus out before it's discharged into the waterway, the last bit of nitrogen, depending on the problem. In Moreton Bay in Brisbane, it's nitrogen that's the problem in Moreton Bay. In the uh, rivers of Sydney and indeed in uh, the Peel in uh, Mandurah in Western Australia, the problem is phosphorus and it depends on what's the limiting nutrient. But it's incredibly expensive and incredibly energy intensive and uh, material intensive to remove those last bits of phosphorus and nitrogen. But that's what we're doing in order to try and solve the problems of the centralised system that we created over 100, 150 years. So we also the, the first generation of reuse was... Uh, let's use, let's put something on the end of a sewage treatment plant and put it back to agriculture. We saw that with Bolivar with the, uh, in an attempt to deal partly with the, uh, the growth of seagrass in the, uh, in the bay, in the Gulf. Uh, we have uh, the use of uh, treated, you know, high class treated effluent on uh, horticulture. And then the next stage was, well, we want to try and offset the potable water use, the scheme water use. So we need, in order to do that, we need to give it to industry. So we see uh, Blue Scope Steel in Wollongong has got the largest recycling system in Australia, uh, which is about uh, 20 megalitres a day. Uh, and we then saw the growth of what we call third pipe or dual reticulation systems, where new subdivisions will have a, uh, a, a, a second water supply pipe, coloured lilac, to distinguish it from the other one, which will supply the uh, toilet and the outdoor. And now, in some places, uh, such as in Newington and Sydney, it will also supply washing machines. Uh, and so that's, you can picture that that's quite expensive. You're taking the system and you're duplicating it. So, and you're not necessarily getting any offsets in terms of the, the supply system. You're in fact making two of them. So this is a, again, I'd call it a third generation or transition uh, strategy. And the other options, of course, that are being explored are the use of high level treatment of uh, wastewater to then use to substitute for environmental flows. The river needs more water because we're taking so much upstream. We take it upstream, we discharge it, we treat it to a high level and put it back into the stream to substitute for the water that was taken upstream and so on. Uh, 